excited. I'm excited to start this new series, Sweeter Than Honey. Somebody was telling me that they felt like we needed to have honey and biscuits in the lobby. So uh, uh, after that beginning, they were like, hey, you got our hopes up. But uh, no, it's pancakes and bacon for the kids upstairs. So uh, they'll, that'll have to suffice. I'm excited to start this series. We're going to look at honey in the Bible and, and, and how it relates to us, how it speaks to us. So I'm excited um, to, to begin a, a little bit of a different series. Turn, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy of all places. That's where we're going to begin tying into the song that we sang this morning. This morning, I want to talk about honey from the rock. This morning, honey from the rock. Deuteronomy chapter 32, towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 32. My, uh, my Bible calls this chapter the Song of Moses. And it is. This is the, the song that Moses writes at the end of his life for the children of Israel to sing. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we're going to begin with verse 12. Deuteronomy 32 and 12. So the Lord alone led him. I'm going to stop right there. Him in this refers to the children of Israel. So he's talking about the the Hebrew people. So when it says the Lord led him, what Moses is saying is the Lord led us, basically. The Lord led the children of Israel. So the Lord led him, and there was no foreign God with him. God made him ride in the heights of the earth that he might eat the produce of the field. He made him draw honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in the next few moments that you will speak to all of us. We want to hear from you this morning. Speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The local news doesn't do a lot of things really well. Um, They usually are focused on the most negative aspects, right? Uh, You've heard this in local news coverage. If it bleeds, it leads. So, So that is local news coverage. That is what they're, and so they're always looking for that angle and they're always looking for something that keeps you tuned in to the local news. And usually that's tragedy. Usually that's terrible things. Now, how many times have you seen this? Somebody in a, in a neighborhood gets arrested for some horrible thing, some horrendous thing, and inevitably the local news crews go out there and they decide to interview one of the person that was arrested, one of his neighbors. What do they inevitably say? This is what every neighbor ever interviewed in every local news coverage ever always says. I don't know. He just he was a real quiet guy. He kept to himself. You're like, man, he ate 14 people. <laughs> they found a foot in his freezer. And all you, well, he was a really quiet guy. He just kept to himself, no matter what it is, right? Always, that inevitably is how they describe the neighbor, no matter what. Now, some of it may be they don't want to admit on local news that they were friends with the local cannibal. But I would say that probably, probably... The more pressing issue is that's the only way they can describe them because they didn't know them. They didn't know them. So instead of saying the logical thing, which is, I don't know that person, I didn't really know that person, desperate to be on television, desperate to be famous, we allow ourselves to be interviewed by local news crews, and then all we have to say is, well, he was really quiet, he kept to himself. All that to say, Today, if you left this building and walked out into that parking lot and somebody came up to you and approached you, said, hey, I saw you coming out of that church. Tell me who God is. How do well can you describe him? Do you say, well, you know, he's kind of a quiet guy, he keeps to himself. (laughs) You see? How well do you know God? Can you describe him? Now, in the Bible, other than Jesus himself, no one in either Old or New Testament has a more intimate relationship with with God than Moses. Moses speaks to God. God guides him. God directs him. God spoke to him out of a burning bush. God um, God writes the, the, the law 
on tablets of stone, the finger of God. And Moses watches it. Moses goes up into Mount Sinai for weeks and it's just him and God. When he comes down, Moses' body is so bright. His face is so bright that nobody can look at him. So they put a towel over Moses' face until it wears off. It's an amazing thing. Moses has the most intimate relationship with God other than Jesus in the entire Old or New Testament. So what can we learn from Moses? At the end of his life, Moses sits down and he says, I'm going to write a song about God. Now here's what he does. In this passage, he uses rock to describe the rock, to describe who God is. There are five different places in this passage where rock is capitalized, expressing to us that Moses is making a direct connection between the rock and God. That's what we want to look at. Now, the passage we read, honey from the rock, that is not a reference to God. That is honey from an actual rock. He is talking about how God provides. But there are five places where rock is capitalized, and he is talking about God, the rock, big R. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, ooh, five different places, five points. This could, this could go for a long time, right? <laughs> Trust me. I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing, okay? So, Will, you always get nervous. Before, before I was pastoring, we went to a church one time, totally off this point, but I was just going to tell you, went to a church one time, and this guy started his message. Courtney will I promise you this is correct. He started his message by talking about how he had 12 points. And I was like, oh my Lord, we're never going to get out of here. 12 points? Do you know how... All right, regardless, I don't have 12. I only have five and I know what I'm doing. So let's dive in, okay? So this is how Moses describes God. Deuteronomy 32 and verse three, turn there first. Deuteronomy 32 and three, we're gonna spend the whole time in this passage, the song of Moses. 32 and three, for I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. Do you see that big R? He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. The first thing is God is a holy rock. He is a holy rock. He is perfect. He is holy. He is, he is lacking nothing. So many, so many times we often misunderstand the idea of holiness uh, when it refers to God. Now, God is holy in the sense that he has no sin, but he is also holy in the sense that he is complete. This is really, really important to us in our understanding of who God is. This, this message, this teaching is about God. It's, it's not, it is about how we relate to him, but I want to make clear, this is about who God is, and God is holy. He is complete. He is perfect. Moses tells us that. This is vital to our understanding of God, because imagine if you served, if we served an arbitrary and capricious God. He just wakes up one morning and he's angry, he's mad, he looks down and he says, okay, everybody that lives in Barrow County, Georgia, named Travis leprosy. That's bad news for me and several guys in this church. There are a number of us. Multiple Travises is actually Travi. I'm not sure if you know that or not. That's a group of Travises is Travi. But imagine if we did that. You would never know what was coming next. You would never know what God was going to do next. What's he going to... God is complete. He is perfect. He is holy. This is wonderful news. People say all the time, well, can God do everything? And often, young Christians, we, we explain, yes, God can do everything. But listen to me, that is very, very, very wrong theology. And it's very wrong understanding of God. God actually cannot do everything, and that is wonderful news. We are not re reducing who God is or the power of God or the infinite majesty of God, but stay with me on this. There's some stuff that God cannot do. God cannot change. God cannot sin. God cannot stop being God. God cannot add anything to himself that makes him more God, and he cannot take anything away from himself that makes him more God. God is holy. He is complete. He is perfect. 
This is wonderful, wonderful news. God is holy. He is perfect. He is the rock that we can trust in. His justice, his truth. He doesn't change. He doesn't doesn't need anything else to make him more God. God is God, and he is holy. He is perfect. He is whole. He is complete. It's really important for us to get a hold of that. Otherwise, our understanding of God leads us into really bad, weird places where bad stuff happens to us or bad stuff happens to people that we love and we begin to think to ourselves, God did this. You understand, there's a bunch of stuff that God, he doesn't, he can't do everything. That is not to say, teaching this is difficult. That is not to say that we're getting into some sort of philosophical discussion. Well, can God make a rock that he can't pick up? Oh, that is philosophical foolishness. You understand that, right? Because if you say yes, then he can't pick the rock up. If you say no, then he can't do everything. That is idiotic. I am not talking about the miracles and power of God. I'm talking about the idea that God doesn't just capriciously decide I'm going to wipe out everybody. Or what if he decided I'm done forgiving this? I'm done offering grace for that sin. I'm done with people that look like this. I'm done with the folks that act like that. But instead, our God is never ending. He is perfect. He is complete. He is whole. He loves us. He is a holy rock. All right, now, stay with me. Moses continues on in Deuteronomy 32, now 15. In this verse, it says Jeshurun there at the beginning. That is a nickname for the children of Israel. Again, it's the children of Israel. So we'll just say that. But the children of Israel grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese. For he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock, big R, and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. The next thing is that our God is a saving rock. Our God is a God of salvation. He is the rock of salvation. He saves Utterly and completely to anyone, to everyone, to all of us. He is the rock of salvation. Again, this is wonderfully good news. This is amazingly good news. And we need to fully comprehend the salvation that is God. And it is this. He is not just a God of the eternal and everlasting salvation. Is he? Yes, yes, he is. It's not a trick question. He is. He saves us in the sense of an eternity spent with God in heaven. Eternal life, heaven, salvation. But the rock of salvation is so much more than just eternal salvation. That, that's a wonderful aspect of who God is. It's great. It's awesome. But there is more to God than us just praying a prayer of salvation so we can take out eternal fire insurance. You understand what I'm saying? Well, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell, so I, I, uh, you know, I'm going to pray and get saved. But a God of salvation, the rock of salvation is the rock of salvation for what he did do, what he is doing, and what he has yet to do. He did save you that moment of of connection, of relationship where you believe, as Paul tells us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. God did save you. So many of us then just tread water waiting to die so that we can be saved eternally. But between the moment of salvation And the moment that you pass away, that's a whole bunch of life in between there. And there are a whole lot of people and whole denominations built on the idea of do this, have this moment of salvation. And then you say, great, I had that moment of salvation. What do I do now for the rest of time? And they go, well, you know, do the best you can. Maybe you'll die real soon and go to heaven. Maybe you'll live for a long time and be miserable. 
Have you ever met miserable Christians? There is nothing more miserable than miserable Christians because they know inherently deep down inside, somewhere inside of them, they know that it's not supposed to be like this but they can't figure it out because they have missed a step. He did save, he will save, but he is saving. He offers us power and grace and mercy. He offers to fill us up. There, He wants life for us. He is a rock. He is the rock, the rock who saves, the rock who continues to save, the rock who never stops saving. Those of you that have kids know this. Your kids don't ever stop being your kids. I was so foolish when I was in my 20s. I thought, if I can just get these kids out of my house, man, it'll be great. And they'll be adults. Me and Courtney can do stuff. And they'll be adults and they won't bother me. And I won't have to do anything for them. <laughs> right? I am helping them. I won't say saving because I don't want to compare myself to God, but I, I do help them. I did help them. I am helping them. And because I know them, I will help them. <laughs> so you think, you think, well, that's the last time I'm going to help. That's the, it's oh, now they're adults. They're not adults. They're just big. They don't, that, <laughs> They didn't get, they didn't become adults. They just grew. They just taller. You know what I'm saying? Because you do help them. You did help them. You got them through third grade and you kept them from getting kicked out of high school and you are helping them and you will help them because you love them. Our heavenly father, God, the rock of salvation is the same thing. Yes, there has to be a moment of salvation and it changes us and it transforms us. But he doesn't then abandon us and say, well, I'll see you when you pass away. Good job on that salvation thing. Otherwise, you would have been going to the bad place. That's not how God works. God says salvation begins now. But I am saving. I am changing. I am transforming. You need to look different than the person you were before you encountered salvation. The rock of salvation changes us in a moment. But the rock of salvation transforms us for a lifetime. He does save. He is saving. He will save. We get to spend eternity with the rock of salvation because it's the essence of who he is. He did. He is. He will. The rock of salvation. Now Moses Others, Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson, you go, hey, Thomas Jefferson was a Christian. Thomas Jefferson was not really a Christian. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. And Thomas Jefferson believed that God had made everything. He believed there was a God. He believed he put the universe in practice or in place and he got everything going. Basically, you reduce God to a watchmaker. God makes the watch. It's timed out the dials, the springs, the, the spokes all go together. He puts the hand in. He puts everything. He puts, puts the watch in place, sets it on the desk, and then leaves, never to return, never to interfere with the watch again. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our God is a creative God in that he creates and he is constantly creating. He made the universe. You remember this in the, in the story in Genesis, in the creation story. The first three days, he makes everything. He forms the earth. Then in the next three days, he comes back and fills all those places in. He puts 
uh, fish in the ocean. He puts animals on the land. He puts birds in the sky. He forms it and then he fills it because he is a God of never ending creativity and creation. He has made you, but he did not make you a little watch and then put you in Georgia and say, good luck. He continues to create you. He creates blessing in your life. He creates opportunity in your life. He creates new destinies in your life. Listen to me. There's not just a one, there's not just a single destiny for your life. People say, all right, I'm going to do a little preaching today. So people tell you all the time, right? You hear guys, usually guys that don't pastor local churches, guys that are on TV or guys that are trying to sell books. They go, there's no plan B for your life. Well, Lord, there better be. Nobody in here still on plan A. I know, a bu- I know y'all, a bunch of y'all down on plan R and S. There's no plan. No, God, the creative God, the rock who creates is operational inside of our own decision making. This is wonderful news because otherwise, if you say there's no plan B, then you have the plan for your life and it's stretched out like a plumb line from birth to death and you just occasionally are either on it or off of it. And most of us, most of the time are off of it because of our own bad decisions. But that's not who God is. God's wonderful creative plan for your life, your destiny, your purpose, your future It changes within the decisions that you make. And you say, well, does that make me more powerful than God? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is even when you sin, even when you screw up, even when you make mistakes, the creative rock, the rock who creates still has purpose and destiny and plan and future for your life. You say, God, I screwed that up. I guess you're done with me. He says, no, Travis, we're on to plan Y. I'm actually into the double letters. <laughs> I'm on plan double T right now. I've gone all the way through and I've gone almost all the way through it, right? But that's how God works. That's what's so wonderful about a God who creates. He doesn't, well, you messed it up. Look at that decision, Travis. I had this whole thing laid out for you and look what you did at 15. What a mess you made at 15. I don't have anything else to do. You messed it up. I had the plan all laid out and your decision screwed it up. Then, then you see that? Then that does make us more powerful than God. If he only has one plan and you get off the path, that means that your decisions are more powerful than God's destiny for you. But it's actually the opposite. He says, this is the path. And you go, well, I like that path, but I'm 16 and I'm a moron. So I'm going to go over here. And God says, okay, we're going we're, we're gonna to be operational inside of this dumb decision. And now he says, here's a path. And you say, well, I like that path, but I'm 26 and I'm a moron. So I'm going to go over here. <laughs> and then you think it quits. And then trust me, you're 47 and you're still kind of a moron sometimes. <laughs> and God doesn't leave us or abandon us because he is the God who creates. He's the God who creates There is no sin, there is no stupid mistake, there is no idiotic thing that you can do that God says, well, I can't do anything with that. I can't do anything with that. God never says that. He is the rock who creates. He has a plan, a destiny, and a purpose for your life. He has creative ways to bless you. He has creative opportunities for you to embrace. Things that you never thought you would do that God is making a way and you go, wow, that's amazing. I never thought of doing that. And God says, I know, but I'm like God. And so I thought of it. You're like, wow, that's amazing. Thank you, God. Because he's the God who creates. Moses is not done. Look at Deuteronomy 32 and 20. Oh, sorry, excuse me, 30, excuse me. Can't read my own handwriting. Deuteronomy 32 and 30. How could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? So stay with me on this one. This is, it, it, it's not clear when you're first reading this. Moses is saying, how can, how can one of the enemy chase a thousand of us? How can two of the enemy put 10,000 to flight? He, Moses is not saying that, 
that the Israelites are one is chasing a thousand. He's reversed it. But that's not what God promised. We won't look at it, but in Leviticus, he promises that they would have victory, that one of them would overcome a thousand. But in this passage in Deuteronomy, Moses reverses it. Actually, put up Leviticus 26 for me, if you will. This is the promise in Leviticus. You will chase your enemies and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. So this has been the promise. But now in the song of Moses in Deuteronomy, it's switched. What has happened? Nothing has happened to God. God has not changed. It is the people who have changed. So the next rock is God is a victorious rock. He is a victorious rock. He wants the victory for you. Now I want to make this clear on this. God is not fighting the victory to try and win for himself. That is already finished. That's done. I I do not like depictions. Well, there's a lot of depictions from Hollywood that I do not like. Let me, a particular depiction from Hollywood that I do not like is in movies that talk about Satan and God where they're like kind of equal, you know? God's the good God, Satan's the bad God, God's, you know, light, Satan's dark, and they're, they're even, they're equal, they're kind of co-workers, so to speak. Listen to me. God is a victorious rock. He has conquered hell and death and the grave. Satan is under his foot. He is victorious. God is victorious. This is so important for us to remember. Legalism says do. Legalism says do this, do that, do this, do that. Then you'll have victory. God's word is finished. God doesn't say do. God says finished. God says it is finished. The victory is won. I am the resurrection and the life. I am victorious. The the grave cannot hold Jesus. He has conquered all. God is a victorious rock. That is so important for us to remember. He has already won the victory. He's already won the victory. The only way that we don't become victorious is to turn our backs on him. The only way that we don't see what was promised in Leviticus and all over the Old and New Testament, we walk triumphant in his victory parade. We don't win the parade. We're not at the head of the parade. We didn't conquer anything. We didn't battle anything. We didn't fight anything. All we do is walk in the the aroma of his victorious parade. You just we just walk behind and just in breathe in his victory. Breathe in his triumph. He is a victorious rock. He, is the, he has won the ultimate victory. He is not still fighting the devil. He is not still fighting Satan. That is done. That's finished. That's important, important, important for you to remember. It, it, it otherwise misinforms our understanding of who God is. God is victorious. It's not that he will be He will be at the end of all things, but he already is. Satan knows that God is already victorious. We know this from the New Testament. Satan can quote the Bible. So if Satan can quote the Bible, then he's read the Bible. Then he knows the Bible, and he knows how this ends. Satan doesn't think he's going to win, Satan just wants to destroy as many of us as possible on his way down. You understand? But God is victorious. He is a rock of victory. He's a rock we can hold on to. He is a rock that is victorious, that has already won. He won before the beginning of time began. He already knew that he was winning, that he would win. That's it. It's over. It's done. It's finished. We talk about this, you know, great final battle and revelation and Armageddon and all of that stuff. But listen to me, it's done. It's all, it's like it's already happened. That is how victorious God is. That is what the rock of victory looks like. It has already happened. It's done. It's finished. The only way 
that we don't put the enemy to flight in our life is if we turn our back on the rock of victory. That's all. As long as you just walk behind him. He's done everything already. You just get to be in his victory parade, triumphant, because he is a rock of victory. Now, the last one is the next verse. This is my favorite one. Deuteronomy 32 and 31. For their rock is not like our rock. Oh, man. If you want a life verse, that one right there, the beginning of verse 31. For their rock is not like our rock. For their rock is not like our rock. The final thing is, he is a unique rock. There is nothing like God. There is nothing that approaches the magnificence of God. There is nothing that even comes close to the power and presence of God. There is nothing that even begins to get close to the victory of God, to the love of God, to the grace of God, to the forgiveness of God, to the mercy of God. For their rock is not like our rock. That, that is the best one. See, what happens is we convince ourselves that all the rocks look the same, that all the rocks are similar. What difference is any one rock over another? Now, I don't want to get into a whole bunch of stuff on different religions. I'm actually not talking about that so much because in a church full of people that showed up on a Sunday morning, I don't think we have a bunch of people deciding to become Buddhist this afternoon. So I'm not dealing with different religions necessarily, although... There's only one rock, our rock, and that's the only way we get to heaven, okay? So that is, that's an undeniable truth about the, about the, that's a central tenet of Christianity. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus said that. All right, so, but putting that aside, what so many of us in here struggle with is not thinking about becoming a Hindu. What so many of us in here struggle with is the rocks of temptation in our life. What we convince ourselves are, or what we convince ourselves of, is that all the rocks look the same. And they don't. They don't. The rock of temptation, there is nothing that is as wonderful as our rock, big R. There is nothing as magnificent as our rock, the rock of temptation, the rock of, um, name them, any of them, the rock of financial success. That rock is not like our rock. The rock of, of, of success at your job, promotion, the rock of fame. The rock of fame is nothing compared to our rock, the rock of relationship. Well, I'm gonna, this person... Oh, the stupidest line that you've ever heard in a stupid Hollywood movie is, you complete me. That's the most idiotic line. (laughs) Nobody can complete you. And furthermore, they don't want to complete you. They want you to complete them because we're selfish and we want stuff from other people. The rock of relationship will fail you every time because it's a relationship with another fallen sinful human. That rock is not like our rock. The rock of of substance abuse, the rock of substance abuse, that rock is not like our rock. That rock tricks you. It tells you nothing is going to make you feel good except this thing. Nothing is going to take the pain away except this thing. Nothing is going to make you forget your past except this thing, whatever it is, drugs, alcohol, whatever the chemical is, but nothing is going to take away. You don't like who you are. You can forget who you are for a few hours by this rock. But this rock is not like our rock. Our rock gives us true eternal peace. It gives us, it gives us true eternal restoration and renewal and new life. There is no rock that is like our rock. I love that verse. It, God is unique. He is wonderfully and amazingly unique in that he is better than any feeling. He is better than any other thing because 
He is the creator. And all this other stuff is the created. We say that, we know this from the Old Testament. I think, I believe David writes in one of the Psalms, they worship the created instead of the creator. That's what Moses is saying. Their rock is not like our rock. Our rock is more wonderful and more awesome than any of their rocks. So let me close with this. I want to take us back to what we were talking about at the beginning. I, um, I still work for Global Servants, missions organization. Uh, for the last four years, I've been the president of Global Servants. My dad was the president for more than 40 years, and I worked for my dad for a long time. And then about four years ago, dad wanted to retire and do all the fun stuff like preaching and writing books and left me with doing all the unfun stuff like managing employees and budget meetings and board meetings. And he told me when, when he resigned, he said, son, I'm never going to another budget meeting. I'm never going to another board meeting. And he has kept his word. So I, <laughs> I really appreciate him letting me do that. So, <laughs> so dad does all the fun stuff and I'm the president now, but I've worked for Global since actually before me and Courtney were married. So for a long time, I was in the office. Occasionally, years and years ago, I'd answer the phone and somebody would call and they'd want something. They'd usually want to talk to dad. Why well, I didn't let them do that. You know, you didn't know what they were doing or who they were. It was, you know, <laughs> it's a sliding scale of craziness. So nobody's a zero. So you got to just, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you worked at a church, you understand that. So nobody's a zero on the scale of craziness. So you just, you know, or they want uh, something free usually call up, they want free books or free something. And I say, well, you know, we don't do that. We use the sale of the materials to support our missions overseas. Not all the time, but occasionally they would say, well, I know Dr. Rutland. I hope you know that I know Dr. Rutland. Because when I would answer the phone, I'd just say, global servants, how can I help you? They don't know who they're talking to. But they'd say, well, I know Dr. Rutland. And I would always think to myself, you know of Dr. Rutland. I know Dr. Rutland. <laughs> you know of Dr. Rutland. I know Dr. Rutland. That's what I want to challenge all of us with this morning. Moses knew God. And he wrote a song that's 43 verses long, talking about the rock that has supported and sustained him for his entire life. Do you know God or do you know of God? How long is your song? The song of Moses, he talks about God and goes on and on and on. What does your song look like? Chorus, a couple of words. Do you know him? Do you know him intimately? Do you know God Their God, their rock is not like our rock. That, that is what the song of Moses is about. He says, this is the rock that protected me in the wilderness. This is the rock that sustained me in my battle with Pharaoh. This is the rock that led us by day, protected us by night. This is the rock that provided water in the desert. This is the rock that gave us manna every day. This is the rock that wrote the law on tablets of stone by the finger of God. Moses said, this rock, I know this rock. I don't know of this rock. I know this rock. Do you know this rock? Do you know this rock? Here's what we're going to do. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. The band's going to return, and we're going to open these altars. If you have not prayed to receive 
Jesus as your Savior, come to the front. You have to have the moment of salvation. But that's not really what this sermon is about. What this sermon is about is, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know the rock that is, un, that is different than every other rock? Are you intimately involved? Do you know the rock? Do you know him? What's your song sound like? Well, God's pretty great. And he helped me that one time. The end. You tell me you've been saved for 40 years and that's your song. I'm sorry, you don't know the rock. How has he sustained you? How has he blessed you? How has he spoken to you? How has he saved you? How has he freed you? How has he redeemed you? How has he restored you? How has he given you new life? How has he broken the chains? Do you know the rock? Do you know the rock? Do you know him? If you don't know him, come to the front and spend a few moments talking to him. Spend a few moments in his presence. There is no rock like our rock. Our rock is above all the rest of it. Our rock. Our rock. It's a rock of salvation and love and freedom. There is no rock like our rock. As I pray, I want you to think, what does my song sound like? Challenge yourself. What does my song sound like? And then come to the front. Spend some time in his presence and add a new verse to your song. Discover something new about the rock that is above all other rocks. I'm going to be right here because I need something new from the rock this morning. And my feeling is many of you do as well. There is no rock like our rock. I encourage you to encounter him this morning. Let's pray. God, I ask that you finish this simple sermon in the hearts of every person. There is no rock like our rock. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you're doing, for your salvation, for your victory, everything. We thank you. There is no rock like our rock. We just want to spend a few moments in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.